lecture. Okay. And then uh, before he start, uh, I will just mention a couple of things about uh, Professor Nobuhisa Kobayashi. And then this is lecture number eight, right? So if I'm not mistaken, what is the topic of lecture number two? Anyone? <laughs> if you answer correctly, you will get the <coughs> box. <laughs> if not, then I'm sorry to say. Exactly, coastal process. And lecture number four? <coughs> coastal structure. So today will be related with coastal again, without with something what we call sediment transfer in the coastal area. So we are we already discuss about the coastal process and then Paedi by Pabagus and then Paedi talk about the coastal structure and now Prof Nobu Prof Nobu will talk about the sediment transport so before uh, giving the lecture I will just mention a couple of things about a couple of things about uh, Prof Nobu brief CV why because if we are we if we discuss about all the things then we are going to miss the lecture so Prof Nobuhisha Kobayashi did his university in Japan in 1974. I'm not even. PhD <laughs> in Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, MIT in USA. And currently, he is a professor, full professor at the University of Delaware in United States of America. He's been doing something like what we call coastal engineering, sediment transport mechanics, coastal structure. Paedi already talked about this one, and then offshore engineering, transport and mixing processes, wow. and also hydraulic engineering. And then this is a couple of uh, professional society, founding members of Coast, Ocean, Sport, and River Institute, ASI since 2000. And then he edited a couple of books, such as Rational Design of Mound Structure, Wave Forces on, on Incline and Vertical Wall Structure, and also Coastal Structure in 2011. So there is a couple of chapters in books also, Prof. Nogu has written, such as Materials for Marine System and Structure, Arctic Engineering, Wave Forces, Advanced in Coastal and Ocean Engineering, and also this is the latest one, Handbook of coastal and ocean engineering. So he has published 150, wow, 150 journal papers. Compared to me, below 10, Prof. So <laughs> no, it's, it, it's 15 it, times. It's not the numbers. Either. It's not a number, okay. <laughs> numbers. <bro. laughs> and also 250 conference papers. So because again, uh, this is a lecture. This is not a webinar, so there will be no May, what do you call it? Uh, so there will be no <coughs> mediator, moderator, moderator, so it will be interactive. So I will present you Prof. Nobu Pisha Kobayashi, what we call, used to call him Prof. Nobu. Please, Prof. Yeah, Nobu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, oh. Here, here. Uh, Selamat pagi. Uh, and uh, good morning and uh, Ohio. <laughs> and uh, that's the Japanese. Okay. How about, do we get this? My connection with the ITB is uh, I, I supervise two PhD students from Indonesia. They came back here and then they are doing very active. So that's more like 35 years ago. And then this time they asked me to come to Indonesia. This is my first time to come to Indonesia. Uh, I go to the other countries, but uh, Indonesia is still regarded as uh, new in coastal engineering relative to other countries. Okay. Today's talk is a little bit unusual. This is a three topic. 
uh, in one month, I sure. have to give a talk like this at the International <laughs> Conference of Applied Coastal Research, which will be held in Istanbul, Turkey. And Dawa is a mostly coastal engineer. So instead of a lecture format, you will see actual research. And this conference in Istanbul, attended by master's student uh, and the PhD, and they have to do the presentation. This conference, uh, this one, you just attend the class and uh, learn different topics. So trend is you have to show you can do creative work and that kind of stuff. So anyway, I'll go through this. And since some of you are really environmental engineer, I will uh, not spend a lot of time in detail, but uh, I'll talk more about uh, essentially more like a, your, your profession development. Can I? Okay, so first topic. So this is uh, based on a PhD work done by Tintin Zhu from uh, China. And uh, she is not from the top student and not from the best university in China. That's usually Xinhai University in Beijing. Uh, I attended there. I went, I was invited to go to Qinghua more than like 10 years ago. Then Xi Jinping is same university. The one before president is also same university. So they have monopoly of all this uh, higher politician. Okay, then point here is she really improved as a graduate student. So what happens is some students really grow, even though start lower, some students already stretched, then they may not improve that much. So question is how to improve yourself. Okay. And then her case, she, she realized that she can be a good researcher. Now after PhD, she went back and uh, working in a research lab in Indonesia, no, no, in, in China. This is the outline of this particular talk. And you check, this is more like how to do research, okay? Then for this particular case, there's experimental data is available. So we use that. But the numerical modeling part, we came up something new. Major difference between research and the consulting is research, you have to create something new. You need to be creative. And then to create something new, you need a critical thing. On the other hand, the consulting work, you use existing knowledge. And, but you can come innovative solution to particular problem. But so you worked on a particular project and then <coughs> the, as an engineer, MIT teach you engineer, you identify problem, analyze problem and find the solution. You have to find the solution. On the other hand, Coastal scientist may analyze, uh, identify problem and analyze, but they don't usually come up a uh, solution. The reason there's a problem too complicated, it takes another 20, 30 years to understand what's going on. On the other hand, the engineers, you have to do something about it, even though you don't know everything in detail. Okay, the reason I'm emphasizing this is 
the emphasis, especially American education emphasis is critical thinking and creative creativity. And I'm not sure you know the chat GPT came up, uh, generational AI. So what happens is in future, if we, we used to take 10 engineers, it can be environmental, civil, or coastal, then they may need all seven engineers to solve it. So usually chat GPA do routine type of work because they have lots of memory, so they, they remember everything. So all you can do is just repeating what's in the manual, your future is limited, okay? The reason is they don't, they don't need you. The computer can do it for you. So situation is similar to 90, 70s, 80s, robots is uh, introduced in a factory. And there are lots of blue color workers uh, laid off, 70, 80s. Personal computer was uh, introduced 1990. So engineers became more productive. Then, then after that, uh, so, uh, social networking, that one turned out to be, didn't in, in, increase your productivity because you are, disrupt, uh, you are not really doing anything really productive. Okay, so next 10, 20 years, we may need less engineers. So routine work may be done by AI. Then it's bad for Indonesia because Indonesia's sort of population is increasing. And then you have to create lots of work. But then because of technology said we need less engineers. On the other hand, in Japan, they may say it's good for Japan because population decreasing, we don't have enough engineers, then they say, okay, no, it's fine, we can use uh, AI. So different countries, different situation. Okay, so another way to put it, you have to pay attention to what's happening in society, which is gonna affect you 10, 20 years later. Most likely this one is 10 years later. Okay, so to succeed, Okay, AI is based on existing knowledge. So AI is the, can read all the manuals, but they cannot do anything new yet. Some people, they're trying to develop AI, can, AI that can think like humans. So this knowledge is already existing. Combining this, come up something new. My hunch is that's gonna take some time more, longer. Okay, so make sure, uh, try to understand, as, uh, try to understand what you are doing, and then you have to think, can I do something better? And then can, can I come up with something new, create? Okay. And this particular topic is, uh, this is uh, Dunes. Dunes is a sand, and it has some trees. And uh, in the US, we tend to use sand dunes, protect houses here. The, during a storm, water level goes up, it's called storm surge. And then we have tide, storm tide, and then large waves hit, and then cause erosion, and sediment goes offshore. So this one, you have sufficient sun, so these houses survive. But you, if you have more, these are gonna be destroyed and houses destroyed. So you have to predict for given storm, if these houses are okay. Then traditionally in the US, we used 100 year storm. Storm which occurs once every 100 years, 
or if so what happens is if we say storm occurs every 100 years then most of the residents say oh it, it occurs one, only 100 i don't live 100 years so i don't have to worry about it so mm -hmm. they change the name saying there's a one percent chance one over 100 one percent chance the storm occurs every year so if you take particular one year what's the probability and then climate change says sometime we're getting 100 year storm uh, every year so now they start changing the design to 500 year storm okay so once climate start changing you have to adjust what may be the best way to do it okay and then this is this is we worked this before and this sediment is a cohesionless some of you study the soil mechanics cohesionless means they don't stick each other on the other hand this is cliff and some sediment this has sand gravel and clay and silt and clay and silt is cohesive okay and then surprisingly there's no model to predict this kind of erosion so major difference is this one is sand so it's easier to predict this one you have to consider strengths of cohesion of sediment so what happens uh, during a storm water level is higher hit these uh, toe of the cliff and then this sand may fall down then if sediment fall down this sediment protect if you have sand here or sediment here it's protect uh cliff okay so you have to predict for so this uh, water level wave conditions this how much erosion occurs but at this moment the way it's done is uh, if it's eroding eroding some location with 10 meter a year then it's it's a large value especially if you have a house on top so typically people measure where the cliff is cliff edge here and nowadays you can use satellite to measure this cliff edge or a crypto and then if you have satellite image every year then you can tell how much eroding every year so it's a it's so-called uh, observational approach that means we, <coughs> we cannot really predict so we just simply keep measuring it the only problem with that is you cannot say what's going to happen in future. Yeah, if you measure or observing it, you know only what happened before. But uh, you have to predict during a 100 year storm how much could it erode. And if this erosion occurs over the two, 20 meter, then houses are located here, these houses fall down. This is a problem. This is England, but also California has similar problems. And then somebody did an experiment. 1999. This one is uh, British. Coastal engineering is a relatively small world. Some of you, the environmental engineering, environmental engineering have more people. But coastal engineering is relatively small, maybe two, three, two, three thousand. And then so we tend to know each other all over the world. Okay. So this data was available 20 years ago, but since there's no predictive model, nobody did use it anymore. Anything. So we just compared their data with the numerical model. <coughs> this is a cross section. This is you are looking from. <coughs> so wave come here and here this is a 
sun structure. And then this is eroded and oblique waves create current going this direction. So there is a wave can create current. So wave erodes and carry the sound in this direction. Okay. Maybe the, I don't have to go through the detail. And this is the data they had. Wet sand is, uh, is uh, 0.1 to 1.0 millimeter. So it's very fine particle. Gray has much smaller diameter. And it's e once it's eroded, it tends to be suspended. Okay, so this part is related to soil mechanics in a civil engineer. Okay. And they did the fifteen sediment characteristic boost. <laughs> we compare these fifteen tests. <clears throat> And how they measure it, you put the camera on top and uh, you measure the edge of clip. This is uh, 20 years ago, so they didn't have advanced measurement instrument. So they just uh, took a photo and measured where the edge is. So we don't know shape of erosion. Okay, and then the, how much eroded is more like uh, 0.1 meter per hour. So we are talking about only 10 centimeter over the one hour erosion. It's not that large, okay. And then we have a numerical model used to, for sand part. And uh, then we added a uh, cohesive sediment. This is a combined, oh, yeah, combined wave current model. What happens is when you uh, when you analyze the problem, usually you say what causes water movement. So water moves, that causes sediment transport. How sediment and sediment move, that results erosion. Okay. And then this model, first we have to predict wave and the current. And then we have to predict the sediment part. And then cohesion sediment transport, suspended load and bed load means some sediment is suspended in a water cloud. And then it tends to be carried by current, wave induced current. So cross shore is so-called undertow current, around shore is long shore current. <coughs> and also bed road is send sediment move around the bottom. And the continuity equation is uh, sand volume conservation. Yeah, like environmental engineering, typically only equation usually you use is the uh, conservation of uh, specific mass, mass of uh, some pollutant. And uh, so this is conservation sediment of uh, sediment volume. And we have a swash, mod swash is wave go up and down on a beach on the shoreline. That's called swash. And that tend to cause sediment movement. So we have to include And then we have to, this is the equation of continuity bottom sediment. So we have to, we have to predict this. Okay. This is partial differential equation. This is uh, how much sand is moving in a cross shore direction, how much sand is moving in shore direction. Then this sand moves, and this is a gradient. 
the least it's gradient, if you have more sound comes in going up, then <coughs> you have accretion. More sound goes out than coming in, you have erosion. And then usually you solve this, and the question is how to predict these quantities. Then uh, there are different choices you can make. So we use uh, whatever we already developed before. And then we wanted to include long shore sediment transport increase. Initially at the wall, it's zero, and the long shore current increase, we include that effect. Okay, maybe detail secondary. And then we show, we, when you work on this kind of stuff, you typically, you correct your own data or you use data from somebody else. And then you have a numerical model. Then model has certain parameter you have to calibrate. Then in this case, we use two tests to decide how to choose which wave height, which period. What happens is if you go to the beach, wave height is how, how much water goes up and down. And then if you sometimes you have a large wave comes then smaller wave. So question is so-called irregular waves is each wave has different height and period. Then how are you gonna choose which height period for computation? Then we checked this. So that's why he says, and then how you do is, this one is a mean period, the spectral peak period, different two, and then this is the data, then red tend to give a better agreement. So we said we choose that period. And uh, this one's, uh, how to include sediment loss in our own show direction. And then if we, this one is uh, no our own show loss, then it's not enough erosion. This is a cliff crest position time. So this one cliff was located here because of erosion. This is a wall at the end of the tank uh, wave room. So essentially, because of erosion, this is uh, getting closer to <coughs> war. And the then question is how to decide where the edge is. <coughs> this is the detail of numerical modeling, okay. And the usual laboratory experience, uh, numerical model, uh, you have to use what happens when you do the computation, you can calculate all the points. So typically you are calculating value every two centimeters. So this is called the finite different method. So there's a governing equation, partial differential equation, that's a continuum. But for to compute, you need digital value. So that's why you are calculating value only every two centimeters. And then what happens is this red bar, if you assume that the whatever you wrote is deposited here, the black ones, is, this is eroded, some of them are deposited here, but it's uh, transported iron show instead of uh, cross show, offshore, then you get a different result. Then for this uh, data, it's better to use that uh, around show variation of long show sediment transport. Oh. And then deposit area, there's a cross section and some area is deposit, area become larger. Eroded means the area becomes smaller. And then if you assume around show uniformity, you load it the same as deposited. 
when the other hand, if you allow Aroshio sand rod, you get this type, kind of point. So this is explaining what may be causing erosion. Okay, and then some sand go offshore. That's why you're you know, getting eroded. Or some sand is lost along shore. It's, that means sand is moving along shore, but more sand is going out than coming in. And then essentially you say, computed the recession rate, major the recession rate, then it, it gives more like a, within a 20% error. The when it comes to the sediment transport, typically you, you have more like at least 20, 30% error. Okay, environmental engineering, some of the uh, concentration parameters uh, sometimes, uh, even if you do the prediction, you can predict only order of magnitude. Certain things are more difficult to predict than others. And there we checked. Actually, experiments, if you have a numerical model, you can check. If you have a fixed bottom, then you say, if you, in reality, usually we have sand at the bottom. So does it affect uh, results? So what happened to the experiment, there's only 15 tests. Then we develop a numerical model. The numerical model is more general. And then you can check, okay, this particular experiment is done, only sand here, no sand. In reality, if you have sand here, what the difference do you get? So you can check different cases. And the conclusion is, if depth is big enough, points, this is wave height divided the water depth at the top. If water depth is large enough relative to the incident wave height, what happens is it doesn't matter too much whether you have sand on the bottom or a fixed concrete bottom. On the other hand, if you go to the shallow, shallow then whether you have sand or a concrete bottom affect cliff erosion. So this is the advantage of having something like a numerical model. And then this shows, <coughs> this is a deep, large depth relative to the wave height. That's why it's a 0.5. Then <laughs> the difference is small. <laughs> and then we looked into the effects of a clay. If you have clay in the sand, what happens? I, as I said that um, in the reality, there's clay, you have to say what's gonna happen to the clay. And then this is the model we use to predict how much cohesive sediment is eroded. Cohesive sediment, this is the vertical erosion of cohesive sediment. This is uh, it's it's so called physically based empirical equation. So, what happens is uh, how sand move or a cohesive sediment move is highly complicated. <coughs> so, we cannot really predict. So, physically, you say this looks reasonable, and you calibrate the coefficient, these coefficients. So what happens is, what happens is if the problem has governing equation, then we solve the governing equation. Yes. In the lots of problem, we cannot solve that does not have a governing equation. <laughs> This is a, a little bit of correction of a slope effect. And then we added a abrasion. Abrasion means 
if you have a cohesive bottom and sand is going back and forth, then that tend to create the erosion of bottom. Okay. And uh, there, on the other hand, if you have a thick layer of sand on top of a clay bottom, clay is protected by sand. So the, you have to consider all the possibilities. So what happens is you have to figure out what, so typically this kind of work, you observe, when you do experiment, you observe what's happening. And then you, you see this kind of behavior. Then can I describe this using equation? Then that part, you need creativity and critical thinking because there's no equation before, so we have to create something. Then problem too difficult, but still you have to use your physical reasoning to come up with equation. Okay, so, so what I'm trying to tell you is lots of unsolved problem, there's no governing equation. Then AI is good at, for the problem, there's no governing equation. But then it correct all those data and then figure out what may happen. Okay. The reason I'm emphasizing is uh, this spring, chat GPA AI can pass the uh, law uh, by exam, by exam, in order to become a lawyer, you go to the four years undergraduate, and then you go to the law school, maybe three years, and then most of the, you have to take exam, just by exam. And most of people take three, four times to pass it. Some people never pass it. And then this chat GPA had 80% chance to pass the bar exam. Okay, so it's saying it's smarter than a lawyer. Okay, so that's why people said, oh, this is a big change. Because AI, people have been talking more like for the last 20, 30 years, the none of them came realistic. The finally, we see that something really useful. But whether it's useful or it's a threat, it's, uh, we have to figure out uh, the reason is there's no copyright. They, they use whatever available, then they don't say, I use this, this uh, references. So it's maybe stealing copyrighted one. And now writers, script writers in uh, Hollywood, working for the movie industry or a TV industry, a TV drama or the, they are striking because they are worried that they will be replaced by uh, uh, AI. And this one is most likely it's really gonna happen. Okay. So here is a, uh, Engineers usually we use equation and the sort of the governing equation in a digitized form, and then we say finite difference method, finite and different numerical method to solve. That's the kind of work was people be doing for the last fifty years. Then it's a different approach. Okay, and uh, so then it may be difficult for us, maybe. We may have to teach you how to use AI. Okay. If you can think, uh, so what I, a good example is uh, I heard that Japanese using AI, and then you ask questions in English, they tend to give you a better, uh, more accurate answer. If they ask in the Japanese, accuracy goes down. Yeah. The reason is you have to teach AI, and then you order to teach AI, there's a lot of, lots of English version, and then you need a big computer 
and then wasting lots of energy, okay? <laughs> this is the problem of AI. Some of the data centers use lots of lots of energy. So the, and I think, uh, so make sure you would not be depressed AI because you can think, okay? Okay, this is the calibration we did. And then we include the effects of uh, gray. And then it, it turned out <coughs> if gray, if gray's resistance is large, recession rate decreases. But if gray becomes weak, recession rate doesn't change. So what happens is if clay becomes too weak, uh, those eroded material deposited at the top of cliff, and then we cannot uh, remove the sediment, eroded sediment at the top fast enough. So this is more like first time somebody computed to show that it's not enough to say cliff eroding, but you have to say eroded sediment deposited on a beach, how they are removed. If they are removed quickly, their cliff strengths tend to determine erosion. If it's so weak, then how wave and the current can remove the sun. And then this is an example of difference of clay, whether you, you have clay or not. And these are compiled. Uh, uh, okay. Then the next topic is this. Uh, she did a master's degree two years, PhD four years, one year postdoc. And then she managed to write the seven papers. And uh, what happened is she turned out to be, she realized she's better than she thought. So ideally speaking, maybe surprisingly, you have just started your career. And some students really improve. Some students don't improve much. And I've been teaching more at the US more like 40 years. Certain students tend to improve better than other students. So point here is that you have to become student who improve. And the students who improve tend to be, they can think. Not some students get a good grade, especially undergraduate, just uh, spend a lot of time memorizing. So what you're doing is you are giving good, uh, good AI artificial intelligence if you are leading lots of uh, starting lots of time and memorizing so that's uh, you are ai so then the only problem is that kind of approach you cannot create anything okay then you have to figure out how to become creative and uh, then asian students tend to think as you get older you become better that's not the truth Einstein discovered uh, this theory of relativity when he's 26. Okay. Newton had the uh, gravity when he's more like uh, 28, 29. And sometimes younger, it's easier for you to come up with completely new idea. If you become older, you tend to bring everything together and synthesize, but not uh, creating something new. When you study, make sure that you really understand the material and try to get into deep. And the number two is make sure that it's not enough. So sometimes what happens, students cannot understand well. They, they simply memorize. That's, that's not a good way. 
you have to really understand what you're learning. So this is a different topic. This one, uh, there's no data. So we did the experiments. And the basic idea come from actually what happened. So good thing about coastal engineering is people want to become coastal engineer because uh, you can go out and go to the beach. You know, that's your work. <laughs> So what happens is this is 2005. Uh, this is uh, Gulf of Mexico. And uh, then this is Alabama and uh, Texas is here. And then this is 2005. And then remember this is after Hurricane Catalina created big opening. And this is, remember, this is a five kilometer. This opening is a two kilometer. <coughs> then problem, problem is if you have this gap, you have tide going back and forth. So this may keep getting wider and wider. And remember these are acting like a breakwater reducing wave height around this coast. So if you have big opening, big waves attack coastline and cause more erosion. Okay. And then they try to close this opening. Okay. So what happened is 2011, they put the Labrumman structure coastal structure here, and somehow sand came back. So this is a unusual example. Especially coastal scientists tend to say structure causes beach erosion. This is the other way around. Structure created the beach. Then question is why? Okay. And this 2010, 11, they built this structure. The reason go like this. 2011, we had a deep water horizon, big oil spill in, a, in a Texas uh, further, further offshore. And then if you have big opening like this, oil can go through here. So to stop oil going through, they built a structure. And this one, the British Petroleum paid something like uh, uh, maybe $100 billion as a fine, remember? And then there's money available. So state of Alabama, so that we have to build something here so that it's not polluted. So this is the one reason, yeah, because you are getting money related oil spill, so you have to justify why you are doing this. But in reality, by building this, they want to see what's going to happen. And uh, their question is, what are we going to do? So <laughs> this is uh, what happened is uh, she had a vacation in Puerto Rico and then she took a video of this uh, coastal structure. So what happens is once you become coastal engineer, wherever you go, you, if you go to the beach and you see what's happening, so essentially you observe and figure out what's happening and there's something interesting going on. So to be creative, you have to be curious. You have to ask why, how, okay? Rather than say, oh, this is what the professor said. So I just uh, memorize it. That doesn't work. You have to be curious. And then you have to figure out what happened. 
Yeah, you 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 had uh, that uh, Newton discovered gravity because uh, he he said why up or fall down. Yeah. If you don't ask a question, you never come up with something new. Okay. What happens is. What happens is uh, agents children tend to memorize, so that minimum is not bad. Most of people can do standard things. That's good. But we have to also create leader, creative people. So you have to come up with something new. Yeah. In the US, bottom one third, they don't have a basic understanding because they don't spend enough time for education. So bottom is bad. But top is encouraged to be creative or critically thinking. Some try to do something new. So those top 10% is pulling the entire society or industry. And Asia tend to be middle is trying to, uh, uh, to support uh, economy. But the only problem is when Indonesia wanted something new, you knew some creative person have to come up with something new. Yeah, because otherwise uh, you, you can create anything new, then you have to be different from other. Because then you are not encouraged to be different in the Asia. <coughs> this gives you an idea about how wave break and hitting. This is the waves, it's uh, relatively small. So, what happens is uh, you go to the beach, and then if you see this, you observe. And then he said, what's happening? You observe and, uh, and then you say, oh, you have a under better understanding what's happening. Okay, then question is, what, 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 what? <laughs> so this particular experiment is, this is the idealized case, this is sand, and then, so you have sand here. Can we stop the erosion here by putting stone? And this is a three layer stone. So this one, that's why I call the rock mound. This rock cover is only single layer, thinner, so it's cheaper. Then question is, uh, can it reduce the erosion? Another way to put it, you want to see whether rock can uh, remove the uh, stop erosion here. And then we did the experiment. So th th three tests. This is a no structure. Rock mount. This is similar to what I actually done at this uh, site. And then this one is, maybe can we do it cheaper? So we just put single layer. Yeah, so essentially I said, this is, it's better to be curious. Then uh, you said, this is three layer, one layer, is there any different? It's a little bit, yeah. Then, yeah. but she had to do more experiment. Then question is, is it, in, is it interesting or not? And then it turned out to be interesting. So this is a picture, and then blue, blue and the green stone is a different size. Okay. This is a single layer, this is three layer. And then this shows we usually measure free surface and the mean and the standard deviation. This is a, so what happens is wave push the water and they increase the water level more like two centimeter for 20 centimeter wave. This is called wave setup. So wave push the water and they increase the water level. 
And uh, surprisingly, this was explained or uh, observed more like uh, 1960s. And uh, what, what happened is this web setup is people measured during storm water level uh, on the beach and behind the beach in the basin. And then water level was higher on beach facing the ocean. And behind the waves are small, so water level is less. So somehow it looked like waves increased water level. Then you have to say why. And then applied mathematician formulated the problem, then they got uh, explained mathematically. Okay, another way to put it, when you observe something, and they say, you have to ask why, why this is happening. If you don't ask anything, nothing new comes out, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, this is more easier to understand. <coughs> so this, uh, so wave comes here to go over. And then this side move onshore. <coughs> On the other hand, if you have a structure, some sand goes through, but it doesn't cause too much sediment transfer. And this one, single layer, this, if you compare this and this, not too much different. So single layer is not effective. The question is why? Uh, this is uh, we want to say eroded area, deposited area. You want to know how things change in time. <coughs> so eroded, this eroded body, as time goes by, you eroded more. And N is no structure case. C is single layer or a rock cover. It's not too much different in terms of erosion here. So the conclusion of single layer is not effective. And then if you have three layer, may, it's, may, reduce, may reduce erosion maybe 100%. It cannot eliminate the erosion. And so the basic reason is So this is uh, before, and then you have three layer, and then after. So it's like this experiment stone didn't move. So it didn't change that much. This is a single layer, then this is before, after. Then stone didn't move, but the sand moves. Sand moves, then sand moves, it's, then it's caused the movement of stone. And then you get this big gap then sound comes out. So that's why it's easy to get, uh, so this uh, single layer didn't uh, protect sound underneath. And then, yeah. so what happened before and after three layer case, R case, structure went down because bottom also settled down. For this experiment, we didn't have any filter. So bottom went down, structure went down. And the thickness didn't change that much. So entire, this thickness, structure went down, but the rock thickness didn't change because stone didn't move. For this case, thickness became thinner because uh, this moved a little bit here, a little bit here, and the entire structure went down. This is the uh, first time uh, uh, to show that uh, this can happen. Okay, another way to put it is, if you put the uh, stone on sand, you have to worry about stone settling into sand. And we create a numerical model, 
I'm not going through and there. We did a computation. And the reason is we did only three tests. We don't have many tests. So we need a numerical model to generalize our results. Then hopefully numerical model is applicable for any situation. Then this is a hydrodynamics comparison. This is a hydrodynamic comparison, measure the computed, no structure, three layer, single layer. Let's give a reasonable agreement if you compare just the area. If you compare actual profile, agreement is not that good. So this shows how it's eroding. Okay. So what happens is the uh, engineer, you come up with some solution. Nowadays, you have to say how reliable your solution is. You have to say what is the expected errors. So your homework exam, you say this is, uh, for this problem, this is uh, the answer, no errors. For actual engineering, what the equation you are using is not that accurate, especially when it comes to the sediment. So this case, it turned out to be, we had a hard time to predict detailed or profile change. Okay, so this one doesn't give the, doesn't give the good agreement. And well, they are, this is explaining how sediment moved. You, uh, essentially, you compute something, then you, you, you want to say why this is happening. And for this case, it, it gives a fairly good agreement. So this structure here, and then how sand changes, and there uh, you can see that this is the initial and the computed is this, measured is this. So that's reasonable, but it's not that accurate. So at least uh, we can use this model to figure out the effects of this structure on sand transport. And this one, single layer, we are underestimating because this model does not have Sand move, uh, sand movement move the sand and create a big gap, and then sand comes out. That that part is not included in the model. So another way to put these lots of cases, you can explain this part, but the other part, this model cannot explain. So then, when you do the prediction. You have to say this model can do this, but we have problem with this. So that people who want to use it understand that uh, capability and the limitations of a particular numerical model. So this is a conclusion. Uh, then this is the last one. <clears throat> this one, we analyze the actual field data. So this is the same figure. Then what happened is, it turned out USGS, United States Geological Survey, uh, uh, pro beach profile. So they measure bathymetry. <coughs> mm. So 2005, this, and 2010, like this. So Gulf of Mexico is then coastalized here. This is called the uh, barrier beach. This is a sand from. Uh, uh, from the beach is uh, acting like a breakwater. 
Okay. And there they created this 2011. Then we don't have a data. That <coughs> this is actual structure. This is two kilometers. And then this is emergency repair to prevent oil going from here to here. So they use smaller storm. So this is more like a 10 year storm, designed against 10 year storm. Okay, and then 2012, you can see a lot of sand accumulated, but not much here. There, we say nowadays, if something changes more like a year, you want to know how things change uh, over the one year, then we don't have details of that. But this one, we, can, uh, we found a uh, uh, photo of this. This is Google, Google Earth, the 2015, 16, 17, 2019, 2020. And there you have, you can see that beach is getting wider. Okay, then question is why? Then traditionally, people say shoreline changes because sediment is transported around shore. So more sediment comes than going out, then deposit, you get a shore. And when we saw this paper, that's uh, the viewer was can see the problem on the traditional way, but we said, no, that's not the case. Actually, the reason, part of the reason because getting wider is the sun coming back. Yeah, because it's eroded and the sand moved to this side and the offshore. Then after you build barrier, tidal current is a, no tidal current. So uh, at the point here is we said that uh, can we predict change of width? Uh, and then the D is in 2015, USGS measured bathymetry. So we took a cross your profile, and then we have a 2000, <coughs> yeah, Dorothy Isle Arab creators. So this one's entire profile is available. The only problem is uh, we don't have any data after 2015. So what we did is we use satellite to find, satellite cannot see the underwater. That's why satellite can see only dry beach with So there's sand underneath, but we, we don't have that data. So there we say, can we predict how why beach became wider? Yeah, because nobody has done anything like this, and so <laughs> intellectually interesting. And then this is a profile of two thousand nine four. So there's a measured data profile here. So what happened is actually sand was here and then they built a structure after sand is eroded, but the tidal current moved the sand here, this side. Some went this side. Okay, then this is a 2015. And then <laughs> you have to say what's gonna happen this profile.
so we have 2015. Also, <coughs> she compared profile uh, the, based on the widths, this widths, and this is a different data source, so called uh, laser is used to measure the entire bathymetric. You compare the entire, it gives a reasonably good agreement. Uh, so we chose different line and uh, show line changes around this line. The show line changes relative to 2015 is based on satellite data. Then L1 is here. It's actually eroded a little bit. This show line eroded a little bit. And uh, at, at the edge, eroded a little bit. But in the middle, all of them are created. Positive. positive means accretion, deposition. So somehow, sand accumulated here, eroded here a little bit. Then question is, can we predict this? And then there's a data, so we, this is a, what happened over six years. It's a really long computation, but this is a computer program. You can simulate or what happens over six years, you just one hour, one hour computation give you how beach changed over the six years. And this is also available data. Typically when it comes to field data, the data is very limited. There's usually not enough data. And then usually when you do this kind of work, this is field side, you, you have to say, where's the tide gauge? Because you have to know how water level changed here. And then there's a tide gauge here. It's, it's relatively close, 13 kilometers east. And then mean high water, tide causes this high water and the low water. And then the difference is sorry, 0 0.361 meter. So in a Gulf of Mexico, water level change due to tide is uh, very small, only this. Okay, the reason is when you see that, is it high tide, low tide? But we didn't know. So we said this is a uh, <coughs> mean water level. And then you need that. This is web data. Web data is located far away. So we didn't want to use this. This is so what happened is we assumed typical wave height period direction at this location used to predict how shoreline changed. And also, this is Katarina that's created a bridge. And then since then, there's a different storm surge, a hurricane occurred. Then Hurricane Nate <coughs> had a relatively large storm surge. So water level high, then it's easier to attack the barrier island. That's the reason why we're interested in storm condition. This is one storm. Other one is six years average wave, how much sand come back. Okay. And this is, we did the computation. <coughs> and then we, we showed the uh, computed results. So this is also calibration. The, there's a so-called bed road parameter. If you use two different values, what the difference? Then this is the shoreline with this increase or with this change, then it affects the bed road parameter. So one reason sediment coming back is the sediment uh, pushed onshore. 
and uh, this one shows uh, do we have to include the erosion due to the onshore sediment transport as well as recovery due to the onshore sand transport. And then we checked uh, different options of numerically. And uh, then this is a comparison. So you can see that this is profile of initial profile using numerically because this is the actual major pro 2050 and the computed one, blue and the red, and this is the major shoreline location. So we say we need onshore sand transport, but also an onshore sand rocks to predict shoreline location. Yeah, this one, yeah, so it gives a good argument. Shoreline location tend to be predicted well, where if you compare add both crushed onshore sand transport and unonshore sand loss. And this we checked how much sand is moving onshore over one year. And typically, this give you an idea. Typically, surprising amount of uh, sand is moving onshore. 100,000 cubic meter per year sand is moving onshore. What happened is, uh, until 1970s, we didn't know why sand moves around show. And then we've, uh, for the last 50 years, we figured out how, how to compute this kind of stuff. So that's the exciting part of research is uh, you have certain phenomena, nobody explain, and then you say, Eureka, you, you figured out how to do this. Okay. You, and if you are fast in the world, uh, then at least you have big impacts. Okay. Uh, one other thing is uh, when you are young, try to be ambitious. You may not reach to the level you want, but uh, if you are not ambitious, you may not go anywhere. Okay. In a good way, you can be ambitious and that's give you more motivation and then maybe work hard or whatever. And we, we checked the uh, sensitivity wave. This is the wave height, wave height and the period. This is the wave period and the wave direction. So you can see that the all of them are sensitive. And the, the results is a different, but the difference is a factor too. Factor two means there are maybe 100 percent error. And then <coughs> what do we do? Sunday came back and the uh, beach is getting wider. Then what happens to structure? So this is Hurricane Nate occurred. This is a water river. So during a storm, water level becomes high, and the wave height becomes three. This is three point five meter high wave height. And then period is uh, ten seconds, but it can be as large as sixteen. This is wave direction, <coughs> and we use this to compute what we are doing. Is we want to see why the beach protects structure. Okay, so we said that uh, we said that uh, we put the structure that sand come back, and then because sand come back, structure become more protected by sun. So this is a positive interaction. So remember, if for engineers, you want to do something, then that helps other things. That's what we are trying to predict. Typically, people say, if you don't include how beach change, then you are over predicting, you are overestimating structure damage. <coughs> so this is structure. 
So this is A is uh, this profile is uh, hypothetical 2011. So this is uh, bleached <laughs> profiles like this. Then remember the wave comes here, hit the structure, and the cause damage. However, this one sound accumulating in front of the structure. This is 2015 profile, measured profile. Then this sound protect the structure. Then sound came back here. Then these protect beach protect the structure. Okay. So this is an unusual case. So you do certain thing, certain thing happens, and it's improving, uh, helping each other. As I said, that uh, typically people say structure causes erosion, but uh, this case is not. And then we do the computation uh, that, uh, okay, what's going to happen? So what happens is not much changes during a one storm, 72 hours. Even though it's a storm, this one is a water depth is too large, so nothing much changes. Here, we have hit and sand moved offshore. But this one, only the wide beach exists, only this part, the profile changed, but the profile didn't change that much. Okay, so we are talking about what happened six years, due to small wave. This one is during a storm, large wave, but after, Sproha didn't change that much. And this one, we predict the damage, how much structure is damaged. And then this is called the stability number. This is also our damage model for Ravenman structure. And then stability number is the input to and then this particular structure, they dump the stone, so stability is left. If you put stones carefully, stability is high. Then they, this one shows here black ones, uh, here black ones there. The structure may be damaged, three stone may be removed from cross section. And then what we did is what we did is we checked compared stone damage for this beach and this beach. So intuitively the wave comes here and the break so that this sandy beach is reducing wave reaching the structure so that beach is protecting structure. So why the beach protects structure? Okay, on the other hand, this one, there's no beach protecting, so big wave directly. So that's why these tend to be more damaged. And then this is a computed result. Okay, point here is, traditionally we say why the beach dissipate the wave energy, so, but also wide beach protect stone structure by reducing the wave height. Okay, then this is a summary. And uh, you have a five minutes questions. Do you have any? Yes. Uh -huh. So my question is, uh, why, what is creativity and how to be creative on research work? So um, I believe based on what you say in the presentation and what, what my professor say uh, always, like uh, the program statement, like objective should be determined by uh, researchers which are currently and already existing and explored. And while the solution for achieving objective should be determined by uh, determined with the creativity, then 
But my professor sometimes ask me, uh, did you refer from literature um, to determine the solution? Then now I'm thinking like sometimes creativity is com combi com combining something already existing. So then my question is what is creativity and how to be creative? If you add the two existing things, mm -hmm. yeah, this, this research is more like that. Mm -hmm. There you come up something new, interesting. That's uh, a bit creative. Mm -hmm. As I said, completely product, uh, creative means you come up something out of blue. So what happened is uh, when Einstein came up theory of relativity, nobody was expecting that kind of theory. The reason is Einstein didn't go to the university. He self-studied. Mm -hmm. So nobody knew what he was doing, and then he published. Then <laughs> it took time for them to understand them. Eventually, people thought uh, it's interesting. So that's completely new. And, uh, but Einstein's case, he didn't get the Nobel Prize for theory of relativity because it's not proven. It's proven. And then about 10 years ago, people measured the gravitational wave. They measured that gravitational wave, all right, changing the light, speed of light. That's measured, and then they got the Nobel Prize. Einstein got the Nobel Prize for his work of Brownian motion, probability of how particle move. And uh, so typically it's not easy to come up with something completely new. So, so but uh, maybe your professor is uh, not expecting much from a student. <laughs> Because he said the uh, student just uh, uh, use what's available somewhere here, here, and then that's, uh, you come up with the results. So that's uh, maybe true for most of the students, but uh, uh, unless you are encouraged, you never know how good you are. That's a student is one example. When she came, after she came to Delaware, she realized she's uh, much better than she thought. So her case really improved over the seven. Mm -hmm. So that's what I said. Some students don't improve, some students improve, really improve. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your point of view, it go like this. You have to know your strength and weakness. Mm -hmm. Nobody's perfect, okay? There, you have to figure out how to use your strengths as much as possible and then minimize or at least your weakness become average. So I've been teaching there where some students simply get a master's degree, but they are good at uh, managing people or managing project and they intellectually accept, but uh, they, they don't want to do this. Research is some coming up, creating something new. And then, you know, 25 graduated, and then 50, some of them become president of a small company because uh, student is good at, or he is good at uh, uh, managing projects, managing people. On the other hand, uh, I don't have patience to deal with crimes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not patient enough to... Uh, the, so you have to know who you are, who you are, and then you say, if this kind of job is suited for you, for me, and so you have to know who you are, and then figure out what kind of job is suited for you. And in terms of a solution, even if you use somebody else, you have to, I said, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. This is a theory, just learn. I, I gave you so lots of examples. It's a theory, and we wrote a journal paper, but uh, there's 100 percent uncertain. Yeah, so there's, there's room for somebody to come up with something better. So the point here is 
especially civil engineering, and uh, unless you really want to structure, uh, structure everything man-made, you have much more control. Coastal engineering with the nature, uh, dealing with the nature, so it's much more difficult. So the so then you have to think about uh, your personality because uh, my personality doesn't fit to the to uh, chemistry and biology because when I was your student, student biology, everything in memorization. They don't have any uh, quantification. Then uh, genetic uh, analysis and they open the lots of new things. So they still do not have any equations. Okay. So if you don't like mathematics, but they tend to use lots of statistics. So it's a different uh, too. And then AI is good for something. There's no equation. So you correct lots of lots of data and uh, then tell AI, figure out what's going on, then AI can do. But you still need that. So that's the reason that uh, you have to know who you are, what you like to do. And uh, another thing is, uh, if, you find, if, you, if, you, if you like your job, or if a student like the research, yeah, uh, then, they tend to spend more time, then they tend to become better. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you say, well, this is what I have to do to graduate. <laughs> then like, uh, you, your heart is not in. So then you may not uh, improve that. And uh, another thing is uh, your generation is Generation Z. And... Uh, Essentially, you want your own style, and uh, you. Uh, we tend to say your Generation Z is a bit detached. Detached means uh, just interested because you are, you are the brought up at the mm -hmm. age that uh, at the age that uh, you are uh, that uh, you spend a lot of time in online. And the website, so you are more comfortable dealing with the computer instead of people. <laughs> uh, that's the uh, uh, stereotype image of your generation. So, but on the other hand, the idea that the Indonesians uh, like to hang out with people, so uh, it's a different style. But the any point here is you have to know who you are, not only technical capability, your personality. And uh, if you find a job which matches your capability and the personality, usually you like it, and then you do well. No, yeah, no. You enjoy it better than better results. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'm not sure, but uh, in the US we have to support students, so we don't have that many students. So it's easier to do the individual tailor advisement and tailor each student. And I don't know the Indonesia, but in Japan there's so many students. So that uh, 
professor too busy to deal with so many students. And uh, they use students how to write the senior, senior thesis, bachelor's degree thesis. And uh, US, they, we don't have any bachelor's degree thesis because professors don't want to spend the time, waste time, otherwise uh, supervising a student that, who may not want to do this kind of stuff. So, but the point here is, I have to know each student and then just give out advice to the, each student. So I don't say the same thing to everybody. I just to figure out uh, who they are and maybe how to supervise this particular student. So that's uh, <coughs> maybe good thing about the American system. <coughs> but uh, there's a lot of money involved. So that's... Uh, because most of the graduate student is uh, supported by financial project, financial project, and then each student may get the uh, is about thirty thousand dollars, and I have to pay tuition thirty thousand dollars in tuition, and then Indonesian rupee and the Japanese yen depreciated 20-30%, so $30,000, lots, lots of money. But things are more expensive okay, in America because uh, inflation was 10% for the last, uh, now it's getting lower, but uh, last two years, inflation is more like 10%. So the, so the point is, when you choose a company advisor, you have to know the person to figure out uh, which, which person you want to work with. So if you work for com company, is important, but your immediate boss is very important. So when you go job interview, then you have to know who you're going to work with. And uh, then is he, is he or she is willing to help you to grow. And uh, uh, so that's why I think you need the right environment for you to uh, grow and uh, prosper. from Ocean Engineering IBB. My question is, in your, in your slide, there is offshore wave data, then there is wave growth to get the offshore wave data. So my question is, what are the optimum range to place the wave growth so we can get the optimum result from the wave growth for the data? So what happens in the, in the US, in the US, usually you can find the wave data every, 20 kilometers around the coast, every 20 kilometers. So what happened is they actually measure the wave, but also they compute the wave so that uh, they, and then every 20 kilometers, you can find the wave that way. Indonesia, is, so this is a major problem in the next, you cannot find any data or even the tide gauge data. And then you, you want to do the computation using existing computer program. You don't know what is the boundary condition or initial condition. And then whatever you space by. So you can do the computation, but you don't know how good they are. <laughs> so the, on the other hand, Japan is also made, Japan, is actually measuring wave for the last 50 years. So then usually you can find that uh, this one is more like every 100 kilometer. So what happened is uh, uh, they had lots of coastal disaster. Then they said it's important to know what causing what. So they said they have to know the waves. Then they start measuring more like 60 years. Indonesia, 
since the government doesn't want to spend money. <laughs> and uh, I, Korea finally start measuring more like last 20 years. But if some instrument is uh, damaged or are not functioning, I handle they don't repair quickly either. The reason is they want to see, yeah, if you are government and uh, spending money, then measuring all the waves are on the coast, even though you don't know how it's going to use it, they, they don't see the benefit right away. Especially in the Indonesia case, I think essentially government, uh, do you want to spend the money for the wave gauge? Even though you, even if you correct that, uh, you don't know how they're going to use it. So coastal, coastal ocean engineers have to tell, this is very important. We need to know all the wave, especially Indonesia is a, uh, Indonesia has, I think, the, one of the largest area of exclusive economic zone. Maybe not less than US, but if I remember correctly, more than Japan. And you have to know wave and the water level in exclusive economic zone. That's where you can do the economic activity. And uh, then that's the area that you, you are disputing with China. But uh, if you don't know what's happening, it's hard to protect your own interest. Yeah, maybe sand or if you find the gas and then that kind of stuff. So somebody has to convince government it's important. Then I talked to the, some student from uh, Chile, because I had a Chilean student. He said that if you put the wave gauge, which may cost $1 million, offshore water depth 50 meters, it's going to be gone, <laughs> stolen. <laughs> <laughs> stolen, that's what I had. So, uh, uh, so then question is, maybe you can develop Japanese mines are not floating on top. Japanese is Japanese. wave gauge at the bottom. So it's harder to steal. So the, you should pay attention to what's happening in society, not just your speciality. I, I told you about the chat GPT is uh, something happening in society if you don't pay attention you don't you don't know what, what's coming but uh, it's the same that uh, what company uh, so what things happen so that that's going to affect your job eventually okay so the so hopefully that uh, you're going to have a long profession because you can overcome all, all this uh, new technology. Another way to put the new technology is used for your, your sake rather than new technology replacing you. But then I told you that uh, you have to be better than AI. The only difference between you and AI, AI can memorize all this uh, information in a, in a website, but they cannot create anything new because it's based on what's available. But uh, what I had is uh, competition among uh, generative AI now is they want to create. AI, which act like or behave like human. I really don't know, okay. But uh, then you have problems that, uh, so then maybe you don't have to work, the computer can do everything. But then people will get bored if you don't do anything. So the, what happens is, uh, another thing, what happens is, 
don't follow just uh, footsteps of others. Think about yourself, how you wanna, you build your own fu future step. Knowing who you are, what you're good at it. So typically what happened is uh, I went to MIT and talked to people, and the senior person, all uh, then they said, oh, I run the MIT, you now problem solving. Identify problem, analyze problem, the final solution. And the same skills can be used in a business sector. So lots of people who make lots of money started their business. So they started maybe civil engineer, and then do the, uh, their own business. And another thing is, uh, when I was at MIT, computer science only 20, 30%. Now more than 50% is computer science. One department has students of 50 percent MIT students. Then those people is working on chat GPT or that kind of stuff. Then what are we gonna do as civil engineers or a coastal ocean engineers? Then unless we come up with new exciting things, younger people may not come to the civil or environmental or engineering. Then we have to be creating something, uh, make sure that it looks attractive place, interesting place. Another way to put it is, uh, don't be just simply passive. <laughs> I think this question is because uh, <coughs> of data will work so for Indonesia. One of the problems is <coughs> one that you, you said that the government probably doesn't think that it's important enough to have data. And the second one also the problem same in the Chile. We put equipment out there that it got stolen oh. almost all the time. So our problem, the big problem is the lack of data. So we do, I think. That's what his question is, right? So, no, no, the, the uh, say his, his modeling. Uh, I think yeah, first, I think, uh, the, the, the elementary school teaching, you have to introduce our civic lessons so that they know that you are part of the team and stealing how to others <laughs> then it, it also plus you have come up different uh, web kit. okay I, I put the chili chili is actually most per capita income the highest in the south america so economically fairly advanced the, even then it's so maybe this particular gauge is a tsunami gauge so it's uh, uh, the GPS, global positioning system is at that. So now it comes and it goes up, then those, are, on the other hand, the wave part, usually wave gauge is located at the bottom. And then it's uh, acoustic, uh, but then they, they measure the free surface. So you create sound wave and bouncing back from free surface and you can measure the distance and the elevation of so uh, another thing is, in terms of this kind of work, if it's in the air, everything is a laser. Because the laser is a light, propagate to the speed of light. And it's very reliable. Then question is, this is, uh, I think if you're doing an ocean engineer, how are you gonna measure, do something same under the water? The, light do not propagate in the water. So that's why once you go to the water, it tends to be acoustic. Acoustic means speed of sound. But speed of sound in the water is maybe, if I remember, 1,000 meters per second. Yeah. The, and light is, you know, speed of light is 
spatially instant. Right. So the point here is even I'm not an expert uh, uh, instrument, but I still pay attention to what is the new instrument coming up. And uh, so you have to pay attention to what the new products and the, what kind uh, maybe I can use this to do new experiment. So that's why I said, be curious. If you're curious, even though it's not directly related to your work, you want to know. So then you may spend a little bit of time and you don't have to know all the detail. You have to, it's, uh, you, you want to know what's coming, what's coming in particular thing. Okay. But if the past has a question, it's no good. Are you still okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm still okay. Yeah? No, no, but, uh, yeah. Any no. more questions? Oh, I have one other question. Uh, so I have written several rhetorical essays about the past and the future. Mm -hmm. So I was working on, right? Uh, there is a problem I'm not accustomed with, uh, the one that said the uh, bedrock parameter. I think bed load parameter is something empirical uh, from uh, laboratory research side. So, uh, I mean, uh, what is actually a bed parameter? Sorry, bed, yeah, bed load parameter is. This is a bed load parameter related to our sediment transport model. So, when it comes to sediment transport, uh, for Ryan's model, maybe okay. Uh, outside the soft zone. If you go to the inside, uh, another way to put it, you have to know the limitation of different sediment transport model. And most of them are not that accurate. That's what I'm saying. So if you, if uh, Indonesian is using Delft 3D, hydrodynamics tend to be accurate. Eras, sort of Hydrodynamics, uh, especially current speed, there's still maybe errors one 50%. And uh, free surface is typically, you may be able to predict 10, 20%. Sediment, phone line or whatever else, the other model you use, it works certain case only. And even if it works, there may be uh, more like 100%. So the problem is when you write the paper, we don't be, we are not honest to say how good they are. <laughs> they, they tend to say, this works so well, why don't you use my model? And then the other student, other people start using it and they start on case it doesn't work. <coughs> so uh, whatever you do, you have to, so that's the reason you have to pay attention to all the publication. There you have to figure out where it works, where it doesn't work. And uh, sometimes, so I, typically, the, another, another, another way to put it correctly. The reason I'm doing sediment transport is error is at least one hundred percent. If the error is a 10 or a 20 percent, it's already done. I, I, I don't want to spend time on this. So you have to find the area in which we cannot predict well, or we don't know yet. There you may be able to come up with something new. On the other hand, if you work very established area, then it's very hard to come up with something better. Or a, yeah. So you have to be pioneer. Pioneer means uh, you are willing to uh, attack the problem for which uh, we don't know yet. So what happened is coastal engineering started in 1950 or maybe 60. And when I was uh, MIT student, it's, it's uh, a <coughs> 20 years. 
So I'm a more like second generation. So if you're first generation, we didn't know anything. So it's easier to be famous because on the plus know many other people, so it's uh, no competition. Yeah, and then Indonesia is not doing any coastal rising. 1970, no coastal rising. So only places in coastal engineering is Delft and uh, some uh, two, three uh, American university and uh, Japan. Now other places start doing coastal engineering. So the, uh, so you have to know the state of art and who is doing what, and then if I work on this, can we do anything new? So anyway, that's a problem of sediment transport is it's hard to predict actually. And then, so questions are after we have a model which can predict with a 100% error. Question is, should I spend more time to improve? Or, uh, so as a researcher, you, your time is limited. So you want to spend this much time, how to get the most out of my time in terms of uh, publication, that kind of stuff, or impact to the coastal engineering. Then you, I have to choose such a topic so that uh, still lots of unknown. Then good thing about lots of unknown is you don't have to read many papers. On the other hand, uh, if you work on uh, something like a von Ryan's paper, applying, then that's already <coughs> already 30 years old or maybe 20 years old. And uh, so if you are doing consulting work and you have to do it, you have to do it. But uh, it's not exciting if you are doing it as a researcher. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a mid ocean consultant, so three years experience. So it's something that I'm curious about. What are you doing there? <laughs> oh, that, that's the reason uh, I gave abstract of this seminar. Okay. And uh, it has uh, references. Okay. Then, if you're interested, then you can go to the literature. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I get to the Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for this very interesting lecture. Francis, hope you can. Uh, benefit from this. So give a round big applause for okay. uh, he just wants us to play <coughs> no just no So maybe if you write to him and uh, yeah, he's, he's very friendly and helpful. So please do. <laughs> <laughs>